seven. Second Kings seven, and uh, we've been going through <clears throat> the life and ministry of Elisha, and we have a continuation of the story that we looked at last time, which was a very sad and sordid story, if you'll recall, and I won't revisit all of those things. You can just conjure them up in your minds, but one point we need to make was that in the city of Samaria where they were, food was very expensive, so expensive that uh, there was basically nobody who could afford any food, any real food. So they were in a place of great starvation. And food was the most valuable commodity that existed. There was nothing else more valuable than food. So we talk about gold or silver or precious stones here. All of those things were of no value. And food was of every value. And people would have given all of their money for morsels of food, for a very small amount of food. They were in great famine. But we should remember that for many years, Israel had been out of fellowship with God, completely out of fellowship with God, not having any a relationship with Jehovah God who had chosen them. Israel had been out of fellowship with God for over 80 years, 80 years of wickedness. Nine kings there were in succession who did evil in the sight of the Lord. And King Ahab's 22-year reign of rebellion against the Lord was followed by the same in the brief two-year reign of Ahaziah one of his sons. And then came King Joram, also one of his sons. After Ahab came Ahaziah, and then King Joram, sometimes called Jehoram. And King Joram was another wicked king. He continued to lead the children of Israel down the path of idolatry. And God was going to come at this time and judge Joram and Israel together. And Elisha knew all about King Joram. He was not a stranger to King Joram there in the city of Samaria. They knew one another. Elisha had ministered to him uh, before him before, and he did not like King Joram very much. And Joram didn't uh, like him very much. Joram tried to have him killed, and Elisha prophesied that which Joram needed to hear, not that which he wanted to hear. And so it got Elisha in a lot of trouble with King Joram. But if you'll go back to chapter 3 with me just for a moment, we find that Elisha said to King Joram in verse 14, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. I would not even acknowledge your presence if it wasn't for King Jehoshaphat of Judah who was standing here. And so this was this scathing rebuke that Elisha gave to King Joram. Joram was a wicked man. Joram was a man who did not follow the Lord, did not honor the Lord. And he said to Joram, he said, uh, uh, I'm trying to look for it here. He said in verse 13, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy mother and to the uh, father and to the prophets of thy mother. And he said, basically, you need to go back to, uh, back to your idol worship because you don't really want to hear what I have to say. And he, had, he, he voiced that he did want to hear what Elisha had to say, but really he didn't want to hear what Elisha had to say. He had no concern for the things of God. And sometimes we do this, don't we? Yeah, tell me what the scripture says, but I don't really want to hear it. I'm not really going to obey it. Uh, that's just, I'm just doing it for a uh, rote uh, practice, uh, just because it's my tradition to listen to the word of God. But I don't really want to, I'm not really going to obey it. And that's what Joram said. And Elisha said, why are we bothering here? This is where you're play acting. Go back to the gods of your father and the gods of your mother, which was Ahab and Jezebel. So they were following the sins of the Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which caused Israel to sin. And they served the god Baal. And so he said, go back after those gods. And he said, if it weren't for the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. But Elisha, the prophet of God, showed God's viewpoint of King Joram's wicked leadership. Wicked leadership. As the Lord says in Psalm 66, verse 18, David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We don't have a relationship with God if we're protecting ourselves from the judgment of God, from the sight of God with sin in our lives, trying to hide it from him. The Lord doesn't have fellowship with unrighteousness. And Elisha said as much back in chapter 3, he said, what have I to do with thee? In other words, we don't have any dealings with one another. We're not on the same track. What have I to do with thee? What are we doing here? What fellowship hath Righteousness with unrighteousness, he might have said from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Or what communion hath light with darkness? Or what concord hath Christ with Belial? 
Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. Seek help from Ahab's gods, whose prophets were humiliated. Do that. Do those things. But here God deals with King Joram. King Joram, again, saw the failure of the past. He knew the truth of God's word, but he chose to go his own way. And because of Israel's great wickedness, God sent great judgment. And this is the place in which we find ourselves. Syria has come against Israel. They've encompassed the city. The city is under siege. There is no food. And the moral state is degraded because everybody is seeking to maintain themselves, to preserve themselves, and to keep themselves alive. This is the terrible situation. There's a number of characters that we see in this passage. Number one, there is the preacher. Like Noah, you have Elisha preaching the message of righteousness, preaching faith in the Lord, and he preaches trust. Let's look at the passage and see what it says. And really, it's the whole chapter that we're looking at tonight from, from verses 1 down through 20. So we'll read all of it uh, or, or read much of it. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord on whose, on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of, of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall die. We shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots, a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And we see God bringing judgment but working deliverance for his people. Uh, let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us as we look into your word that we'll glean from it what you have for us and that the Holy Spirit will make application to our hearts, uh, the things that we may need to hear now, things that we may need to have filed away for later, these things that you have to help us and to challenge us, to grow us. We thank you for the example that we find from the Old Testament and these stories of real life things that occurred, sad things, hard things, and yet magnificent things when you uh, worked and your promises and your word becoming true as always. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we have the preacher here first, like Noah, the preacher of righteousness, preaching faith in the Lord. And he said, trust in God no matter what. Look what happened in verse 1. Then Elisha said, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. So we've just learned how expensive food was, how it was invaluable. And Elisha says, tomorrow... Food is going to be unvaluable. From one day to the next, the economic condition and the, the uh, food condition of this city is going to completely change. Overnight, it's going to completely change. God said this. And Elisha gave the prophecy that this is what would happen. And he was giving the message of trust in the true God, trust in Jehovah. God says tomorrow it's going to be different. What is your response to that? Trust in God no matter what. Trust in the Lord and in their case, repent of your wayward, waywardness and wickedness and see what God will do regarding your captivity. But they did not turn, and they would not turn. And I don't know why this person retorted to the prophet Elisha. They had seen Elisha give prophecies before. Perhaps as they were there in the throes of their starvation and the, the preacher who had been receiving care, and been able to stay alive himself, they said, maybe he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's delirious. Or maybe they said he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he lives on easy street, and he doesn't have to worry about what's going to happen to him. Uh, we're footing the bill for him, so to speak, and so uh, he's just saying that to keep us providing for him for another day. Maybe that's what they thought. But they weren't going to listen to him. 
The a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the win Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? But Elisha knew the Lord, and he knew the Lord's promises, and he knew that the Lord does things differently than we think he should. By the way, each one of us can become Elisha to somebody else, and you probably have in your life, if you've been a Christian for a faithful Christian for any length of time, you've probably had to tell somebody, this will change in your life as you honor the Lord. But if you won't honor the Lord, this won't change in your life. If you won't trust in the Lord, this is going to end the way it, it is beginning. This is, this is how it is. And you become a preacher of righteousness like Noah to that person. So in every situation, the Lord needs a, quote, preacher, unquote. Someone to tell the truth of God's word. Someone to tell the truth of what's going to occur if someone continues down a certain road to challenge them and say, you need to stop doing this. Your ideology is wrong. Your perspective is wrong. Your actions are wrong. Your desires are wrong. You need to get a changed heart. A preacher, God needs us to be like this for other people. And we know that God keeps his promises. Peter said, God is not slack concerning his promises and that his timetable is not like ours. One day is with a thousand, uh, as a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years is one day. We don't have his intention or his ways or his manners uh, in our knowledge and in our understanding as Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says. Uh, we don't understand the thoughts of the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't understand God's presence. We can't understand God's purpose in our lives often. We can't see what He can see. But we can know His promises. And we can trust His promises. And if we'll trust His promises, then that challenge through which we're going, if we realize I'm in a place where I need repentance like these people were, then God is going to work on my behalf and he's going to bring me through this thing. But these people would not acknowledge the Lord's provision. They would not even acknowledge the possibility of the Lord's provision because they were anti-God, because they were serving Baal, which is why the judgment came in the first place. So Elisha is challenging them with the power of the true God versus the power of Baal. This is Mount Carmel all over again. Which God are you going to serve? Are you going to believe me when I prophesy that tomorrow things are going to be different? Or are you going to resist this and so be judged by the Lord? <clears throat> this is the challenge that uh, Elisha was bringing. He's the preacher. But then there's also the king. We have in verse 2, a Lord on whose hand the king leaned. And really the king in this story is a bystander. It's such a sad thing. And many of God's children, and I'll narrow it down to God's men, are simply bystanders when it comes to the work of God. Bystanders. They show up when it's convenient for them. They show up to do such and such thing that they enjoy, but other than that, they, or that they feel invested in, but other than that, they're bystanders. By, bystanders. And here we have a king who is a bystander. He was supposed to be a leader in Israel. He should have been the one who said, wow, the Lord said it's going to be different tomorrow. I need to repent of my sin, of my iniquity my faithlessness of him, and I need to get right. This is God's judgment on me for my sin. But remember, they blamed Elisha before, and that's what he continued to do. He blamed Elisha. The king is just a bystander. He's a bench warmer in this situation. He's not able to really have an impact for the Lord because he's not invested in the things of God. He's invested in his own things. He's invested in his own ways. He's invested in selfish causes and pursuits. But also, now we have the lepers. Verse 3, there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. Four leprous men enter at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? Why sit we here until we die? That's a great question. We're here and we're sick already. And we're going to die. Uh, if we go into the city, then there's famine there. So we're going to die in the city. If we go out here, our enemy is here and they're going to kill us. They'll probably kill us. So let's go to the place where there's food at least and see what happens. And they were in a, a, a very a, a tough predicament. Their circumstances were not good. And they had to reduce things down to very basic reasoning. If we go here, this is going to happen. If we go here, this might happen. But at least they have food. I guess let's do that. And we're probably going to die for our trouble. But at least we'll die quickly instead of by, star by starvation. This is a pretty sad plight. And many have preached this passage and made, a, made allusion to the fact that there are many people who are leprous in the land who need salvation. Uh, I don't see that really a connection here. 
uh, with these four lepers. But I can, what we can say that leprosy is often a picture of, in Scripture a picture of sin and a picture of the lost estate. And we can say that those of us who are, or those, those who are not believers are in that lost state and they are in a place of complete need. If they go one way, they're lost. If they go another way, they're lost. So where are they going to go to find that which is good? But I see something in these lepers, and that is even the lepers had a basic sense of compassion and the fear of God. And sometimes it is those who are in the worst state who were able to see that. The king was not someone who was in a state of understanding where he was spiritually. Those two mothers from chapters, end of chapter 6 were not in a state where they could understand things spiritually. They were totally focused on what they had, what they didn't have, and how they could keep themselves alive. And yet these lepers had a sense of compassion and fear. Look what it says in verse 8. After the Syrians were gone, they, these lepers came to the uttermost part of the, of the camp. They went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. So they go into the first tent, they take everything out. They go into the second tent and take everything out. But then they realize, wait a second, we're doing okay now. See, before they were outcasts from the city, and they still are outcasts from the city, but they're realizing we, are, we now have something that everybody else needs. And what they could have done is say, they've cast us out. We're outcasts from society. Uh, they, they've, they've not helped us. And they could have said, you know what, we're just going to leave them to rot in that city. And they can find, if they, if they happen to look out and see it, then good for them. But we're going to get what we can while we can. Because they know once they tell everybody in the city, all this stuff is going to be gone. And so they could have continued that. But look what happened. Verse 9, then they said one to another, we do not well. See their sense of the fear of God and shame and compassion. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. See, they had a sense of the fear of God. If we don't do something right about this, then some mischief will fall upon us. God is going to judge us. See, they had a sense of God's judgment, whereas the king is blaming it on Elisha. And these men said, God will judge us. If we have this discompassionate attitude, God will judge us. We need to do something about this. We cannot hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Now this parallel I see when people make the connection to what God's people ought to be doing with the gospel message. Because these were lepers, they were beggars, and they found the bread, and God worked in their heart to tell others. Isn't this what it ought to be in our lives? We ought to be telling others. This is a day of good tidings. This is not a day for us to be self-focused and not a time for us to not care about the lost world. This is a time for us to give the gospel. And we get busy doing what, whatever it is that we're doing, but that's a time for us to not hold our peace, but to give the gospel track. It's a day of good tidings. Uh, when we, we, we have an opportunity with a family member or a coworker or a neighbor or an acquaintance that we come in contact with, that's the, that's the day of good tidings. And we should not be withholding this sustenance of God's word and of the gospel message from them. They said, Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. This we do not well. This is a day of good tidings. And may God convict us when we fail to be giving out his gospel message to say we do not well. We do not well. This is a day of good tidings. I need to be about my father's business and realize that the things I'm involved in, in here are a little bit carnal or a little bit self-focused. I, I need to reach beyond myself with the gospel message so that others may hear. Well, they won't receive it. Maybe they won't. These people struggled to receive what was being given to them, as we'll see. Verse 11, or verse 10, So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither a voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called to the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And the king arose in the night. Now remember, this is the same day Elisha has made this prophecy. Sometime in the night, the Syrians run away. These lepers come and find all this stuff here. That night, now, a day has not changed over. The kings are rising in the night as they come back to the city gates, and they tell the porters to go within and tell the king. He gets up in the night, 
and said to his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. Oh, he's a wise king. I'll tell you what's actually going on here. They've got an angle, and there are people that are trying to trick us. This is treachery. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. They're just trying to trick us. They're trying to draw us out so they can get in the city. We have to keep those gates locked. We cannot let anybody in. And they did not listen to the message of the good news. They didn't listen to the message of the good, good news. One of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, behold they, are, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed, and let us send and see. In other words, I know you want to keep these horses for food, but can we take these five horses, all that's left in the entire city, and go out and see if what they're saying is true? That's all we want to do is take them out and see what they, and I, I know you want them for food, but they're just like the rest of the city. They're consumed. These horses have nothing left on them. But we need them to carry us to the camp of the Syrians quickly. They went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels. I'm sorry, verse 14. They took therefore two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste, trying to lighten the load. And the messengers returned and told the king, so their message was proven true. And the lepers had this compassion. And because of that, verse 16, the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Pretty amazing that the word of the Lord was fulfilled. We have the lepers but we also have the Lord on whose hand the king leaned. Come back to the beginning of the chapter. When Elisha made the prophecy and he said, tomorrow about this time, uh, a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. The Lord on whose hand the, the king leaned, some counselor to the king, answered the man of God. And he said, behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. You see, this Lord on, whom the, on whose hand the king leaned doubted God's purpose and God's plan. He doubted God's power. I don't think God can do it. And he doubted God's promises. I think that this is a lie. Might this thing be? But if we compare our circumstances to others' We presume to have it better. We've lost the battle, like Peter who looked at the waves instead of the Lord. And this is what the doubter does. He infected others. Instead of somebody believing Elisha, nobody believed him because of the Lord on whose hand the king leaned. You know, this reminds me of Numbers 13 and 14 when, they came, when the children of Israel came the first time to Kadesh Barnea and they were at the river and they sent the spies across. Remember, they sent 12 spies and 10 came back with the the negative message and two came back with a good message saying God what God told us is correct what God's telling us through Moses is correct and the ten said no we're like grasshoppers before them and they're going to kill us all and they caused the heart of the people to fear and the people immediately rose up and began to complain see what happens if we spend a lot of time and countenance the person who's critical of God's working will soon become like them and that's a fact what do we learn about the Lord from this story? A couple things. We learn God's purpose and God's plan is vivid. God's plan was hid, but it's now revealed. And he said, Elisha said to this Lord on whose hand the king leaned, king leaned, he said, you're going to see it, but you're not going to be able to partake in it. You're going to see it. You're going to witness it. You're going to know that it's true, but you're not going to be able to experience it. This was what the Lord did with Moses. He took him to the mountain and he showed him the land of Canaan across the Jordan. But Moses, because of his faithlessness, was not able to experience it. God's purpose and plan is vivid. God's plan was hid, but it is now revealed. And it is better to trust God in the famine so that we can enjoy the feast. Remember 
Thomas, doubting Thomas over in John chapter 20. And he missed when the Lord Jesus breathed on the disciples and, and uh, he said, receive ye the spirit. He, he breathed on them, the scripture says. Thomas wasn't there. He missed it. He came later. And then the Lord Jesus rebuked him and said, blessed are you, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who uh, have not seen and yet have believed. He suffered that rebuke. 2 Samuel 22, verses 31 through 33, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. It is God that girdeth me with strength, Psalm 18, 32, and maketh my way perfect. God's promise is, or God's plan and purpose is vivid, but God's power is vast. Notice what the challenge was from the Lord on whose hand the king leaned. Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? This is an impossibility, and certainly an impossibility by tomorrow. Psalm 62, verse 11, God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. In other words, God's power is repeated and repeatable. I, I, I've said it once, twice have I heard this. And we, we hear the two and three witnesses there. God's power is vast. God can do anything. The Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. And I'll skip some passages that I was going to be reading for sake of time. But God's power is vast. God's power is vast. Look what happened at the end of the chapter. A measure of flour was, a fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. It's repeated there. And the Lord's promise, uh, uh, Lord's uh, power was again demonstrated. It's repeated again. In verse 19, when he said, this is what's going to, verse 18, this is what's going to happen. Two measures of barley for a shekel. This is repeated three times. The story is repeated three times. Elisha said it, then the telling of the story happens, and then it's recapped. Almost verbatim. The repetition is to let us know the surety of God's power, the vastness of God's power, and God's promises are verified. Notice what he says, according to the word of the Lord, verse 16. According to the word of the Lord. Why did it happen that fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel? Because God said it was going to happen that way. According to the word of the Lord. There's no question about uh, uh, who, who, who has the final say in a matter? The Lord does, according to the word of the Lord. The Lord on whose hand the king leaned had no say. God said, okay, because of your doubt, this is what's going to happen to you. And here's what is going to happen in the city regarding the prices of food. And I'm going to do it tomorrow. And it happened. And he says, according to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is sure. God's promises are verified. I like this a phrase, except not in the way this man used it, but he said in verse 2, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? If the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? The idea of windows in heaven is repeated. It's back in Genesis chapter 7. And it often happens when people are questioning God. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day, seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. And notice what happens. The windows of heaven were opened. When did that happen? It occurred when people were doubting the power of God. Look at chapter 8, verse 2. The fountains of the, also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. That is by the Lord. Look at Malachi, chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet he have robbed me, God said. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? And here's the answer. In tithes and offerings... Verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith. In other words, I'm trying to get you to trust me. Saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. See, when God opens the windows of heaven, there can be blessing or there can be judgment. 
but it's always in relation to whether or not we're trusting him. And whether that, that comes as a blessing or whether it comes as a judgment will be uh, determined by whether or not we're trusting him. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, he, uses, he references the flood. And he says, those people were not trusting the word of the Lord, and they still say, where is the promise of his coming? Where, he, said, he said it was going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Where's that promise? Where's the, where's the fulfillment of that promise? That's a dangerous place to be, because when the windows of heaven open, they're going to be on the receiving end of God's judgment. Let's not be that way. Let's recognize God's promises, and not only recognize the veracity of God's promise, but rejoice in the, in the truth of God's promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, All the promises of God are yea, in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. God's promises are true in Christ Jesus for us. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The Lord's words don't pass away, and they always become true. The word of the Lord endureth forever, 1 Peter 1 tells us, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Psalm 119, 160, the Lord said, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. This is the word of God regarding his promises, regarding his word, preserved for us today and full of promises that will not pass away. But go back to 2 Kings 7 as we close. Verse 16, And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians, so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. Now, what Lord is that? That was the same Lord from verse 3, or verse 2, who said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? That same guy. So the Lord not only fulfilled all of his promises about food and provision for the people, but he fulfilled his promise of judgment as well. And sometimes we think, well, we're going to get away with it. The blessing has come, and I have escaped the judgment of my actions. But he did not. The king appointed the Lord on whose hand the king leaned to have the charge of the gate. You go open the gate for all the people. Let the people go out there and spoil what they, what they can from the camp of the Syrians. As he opened the gate, the people trode on him, trode upon him in the gate, and he died. As the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. He opened the gate, saw the blessing that God had poured out. Just as Elisha had said, you're going to see it with your eyes, but you're not going to be able to partake in it. You're not going to be able to receive it. He opened the gate, saw it, and got trampled and died. Sad thing. Are you saying someone's going to trample you, uh, trample you tomorrow? No, I hope nobody tramples you. But let's be serious about the word of the Lord. And serious about trusting him with what he says. In verse 18, not only does this happen all according to the word of the Lord, in verse 16, but God defended the honor of his man also, Elisha. He says in, it says in verse 18, It came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king. Just like he said, saying two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And both parts of this prophecy, and that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him. For the people trode upon him in the gate, and he died. You see how the Lord repeats it? Three times this story is repeated for us. What Elisha gave us the prophecy, what the man said, what was going to happen, and what did happen to him. Three times the Lord repeated it. When the Lord says something one time, he wanted us to know it. When he says it twice, he was real serious about it. And when he tells us three times, we better sit up and take notice. God said, tomorrow it's going to be sold for this. 
And because you questioned me, because you would not trust in me, you're going to be able to see the blessing, but you're not going to be able to experience it. I wonder how many people end up being able to see the blessing, but they get cut off and not able to receive the blessing of God because of faithlessness. It's a faithless attitude toward the work of God, toward what God is doing, toward the word of God. Let's not be like that. As we go through this book of uh, 2 Kings and study the prophecy of Elisha, we have so many of these, uh, so many of these demonstrations of faithlessness. It's, I, it almost gets discouraging. I shouldn't say almost. It does get discouraging when you see all of these faithless behaviors of these men. You have to go back and read Hebrews 11 and realize that a lot of people were being faithful to the Lord too. And though they didn't receive the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, all of the promises of God in their, in their physical life, they're receiving the promises of God. They desired a better country. And so we can be like those in Hebrews 11. We don't have to be like this Lord on whose hand the king leaned. We don't have to be a bystander like King Joram, who was conflicted in his mind, frustrated with what was going on, and not able to experience and, and rejoice in the blessings of God. And that happened in spite of him, not because of him. Let's not be like those. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray you use it in our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.